May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome, everybody. So good to say, see you all on this day, especially you all here for the baptism. Very exciting. So today, I'm not going to talk about the gospel except in a sideways kind of way. I'm going to focus in on Acts, because really, what a great story, right? This story of exorcism and imprisonment, but also of conversion and freedom and salvation. As we follow in the footsteps of these apostles, and in the face of current events, what can we learn from this story? For here we are, COVID, and we're all in masks again. And this week in Texas, in Alveda, we lost 19 children and three adults to a gunman. Ukraine is still, the war in Ukraine is still ongoing. And there's so much other suffering. And yet there's also people standing up for rights. Mothers leaping over fences to save their children. Us wearing masks to keep each other safe. And, to the, and tomorrow, Memorial Day, honoring all of those who died to keep us safe. Today is the Sunday between Pentecost and Ascension. Ascension was Thursday, the day that Jesus is lifted up into heaven. And Pentecost, the day that the Spirit comes nine days later and comes into the apostles with beautiful flames and foolishness. Jesus emboldens his followers as he leaves them to a new life of witness and example as he prays in the gospel today. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, so the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The church was being born that's so cool. The church that became us. And it began in Jerusalem. One of the first things they did is what churches do still, is sort of figure out who's right about things and hold a council, because we like holding councils and conventions and things like that. So the Council of Jerusalem was one of the very first Christian councils. And it was a time when they had to come together and decide what it meant for a Gentile to become a Christian. Because you see, at that point in time, Christianity was still very much a Jewish sect. And so the Gentiles coming in, many of the followers of Jesus felt that they should follow the Jewish laws and become Jewish in order to become Christian, which meant circumcision for any adult male who became a Christian. And of course, there were some people who thought that that was just going a little bit too far. And thankfully, they decided that Gentiles did not need to be circumcised in order to become Christians, did not need to become Jewish. Jewish people would keep to their traditions to keep to their covenant with Abraham and continue to be circumcised as babies. But it was not necessary for Gentiles. What was necessary was that they give up their pagan gods and stop doing sacrifices to them and accept the Lord Jesus into their heart. So a new temple was being born, and they were hanging outside of the physical temple. But this was a covenantal community, a community that commanded radical generosity. In Acts 4, they describe it. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. Everything was to be used in common. That was a radical, radical act back then. They may not have had capitalism, but they definitely had profit, and that was a threat to profit. And it was not a new idea, this idea of sharing, of kindness. Back in the Old Testament, Micah, Micah said to the people, he has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly? That's it. You don't have to necessarily have a big fancy temple, but it helps. But what's important in this building is you all. 
in covenant with one another. And what is the new covenant for the Gentile Christians and for all Jewish Christians? Not circumcision, but baptism, right? So their new way of thinking about God was the source of a great deal of persecution for them and in the end led to the persecution and the death of some of their leaders, beginning with Stephen, who was stoned to death in public and in a gruesome way. And in fear and also in their call, the apostles began to spread out. So interestingly, in their attempt to quell this new sect by being violent, the conquerors ended up actually spreading it out into the world. Guided by the Spirit. Acts of the Apostles, many, many scholars would say, should really be called Acts of the Spirit of Jesus or Acts of Radical Generosity or Acts of the Way of Love. So they're sent out into the wider world delivering the message of salvation and also delivering that message of the council. You don't need to be circumcised. And in Acts it says, and the faithful then began to... <laughs> To flock, So there was a barrier, and they took it away and made it about the salvation. Paul and his followers were eventually guided by a vision to Macedonia and the city of Philippi. Usually when they would go into a city, they would go first to the synagogues because it was a Jewish sect, and they would work on spreading the word of Jesus to the Jewish people because they had a framework. They understood the Old Testament. They understood the messages that Jesus was bringing. But there were no synagogues, as far as we can tell, in Philippi. There needed to be 10 Jewish men in a town to start a synagogue. And Philippi was a town of about 10,000 to 15,000 people, including the slaves. So there were not a lot of Jewish people in Philippi. It was very much a Roman city overlaid over the Greek roots, its Greek culture. It was a leading city in trade, big bustling market, very um, religious in its worship of pagan gods. So just before this passage we heard today, the apostles, Paul and his followers, improvise. They go to the river outside of the gate to spread the word of salvation there. And women come. And among those women is Lydia. Have you all heard of Lydia? Yeah. So Lydia is a wealthy female merchant who owns her own home and sells very expensive cloth, so is doing pretty well. And this woman, it says, her heart is opened, and she is converted, and her whole household becomes converted. So that's a big win for, the, for Paul and his followers, for the apostles. And they spend the next several days in the marketplace, the temple of profit, right? And in the marketplace is this slave girl. And she keeps every day running after them, speaking, annoying, being very annoying, and yet speaking the truth. She says, these are men are slaves of the Most High who proclaim to you a way of salvation. And she just keeps saying it and following them around and saying it. You can just see her like, hey, look, these guys, right? But she is doing it in a way that is based out of the wrong kind of motivation, right? Her truth may be truth, but it's based out of a motivation for spectacle and a motivation for profit, not out of a motivation of love or out of a motivation for salvation. We see another time when Jesus exercises a demon like this one who's speaking the truth in the temple. You all remember that in Luke when the, de de the demon-possessed man says to Jesus, I know who you are. I know who you are. He witnesses and recognizes Jesus as the Holy One of God. Truth. But Jesus says, get out of him and leave this place. So that truth, misguided, out of a place not of love, not of salvation, not of care, loses, loses its holiness and becomes something evil even. It leads to a kind of spiritual and bodily slavery, truth distorted. And we see it so often in advertising today, not to mention in religion. So 
Paul and Silas really make the owners of this poor slave girl very angry because now they can't make any money on her. But when they go to the authorities, they don't say, hey, he basically took away our source of income. No. They do what we still do today. They capitalize on bigotry and the status quo. And they say, look at these Jews. Look at these outsiders. They're breaking our status quo. They're, they're mixing things up. And the authorities are quick to then put these men in jail, to beat them, and to maintain the status quo of their power. So Paul and Silas end up in jail. And what do they do when they're in jail? They sing. They sing and they pray loud enough for the other prisoners to be able to hear them. And as they are singing, an earthquake comes. And that earthquake, that is rescue. That is not an accident. That is rescue. And rather than run away, which is what I often want to do, even when I get rescued from something, you know, if it's like shakes me up a lot, mostly I want to go hide in a closet or run somewhere. But they stop. They abide, they wait, and they stop the jailer from taking his own life. This jailer who is so scared and humbled by this, this thing that has just happened, this crazy thing, he asks, what do, I do, what do I need to do to be saved? And they tell him, and they bring him the word of God, and he is saved and becomes a part of that covenantal community and offers them a radical hospitality to the point that he actually washes their wounds and invites them into their home. And his whole household, again, also becomes Christian. So what can we learn from this about our own mission in the world as Christians, as a church, to be apostles, to bring the spirit of Jesus, the salvation of Jesus' love to the world, to be church? So here's what I got out of it, and I'm sure you all can get more. We are a covenantal community in our baptism, bound to care for one another and for all who need our care. As our baptismal covenant says, to respect the dignity of every human being. And we must beware of truth. Truth that is told for the wrong reasons, distorted for profit or for gain, enslaving both body and spirit. Our covenant calls on us to persevere in resisting evil, even when it looks like truth. And when in doubt, when we are trapped by systems that are so entrenched, they shackle us to a wall. Sing. Sing loudly and pray. Proclaim the good news. Recognize rescue for what it is, even if it comes in the form of an earthquake or perhaps a pandemic that reminds us how connected we are and wait there, abide, be there for those who become lost in the aftermath and offer them forgiveness and love. We are covenanted to love our neighbor. So today, as we baptize Isabel and we renew our own baptismal co covenant and we come to the rail to take communion, remember these first Christians. Remember this covenant. Take it deeply into your heart because it is really what we are. It is the call of the church. It is the spirit of Jesus. It is the way of love. Amen.